Now it's our job to not let the pressure get the best of us and trust our abilities to do what we can do to push together wins and push together success. And, you know, in, in today's world, everything's results driven. All these kids, they, they just want the instant gratification of, you know, we won or I scored 30 points or I hit two home runs. And that's just not the reality of it. It's, it's how do you win on your, on your worst days? You know? So I would say 80, 20, because, you know, you got to have a plan as a coach, you got to put them in the right positions, whether they understand it or don't, it's your job to make them understand why this is the way that it is. And I'm putting you guys in a position to succeed, whether or not you agree with it, it will show if you do what we've been practicing and what we've been preaching, because that's the, that's the environment. Because 80% of why I say 80% players is because, you know, it, it, it's not just come and play. You are listening to the Bridging Impact Podcast, transforming leaders on and off the court with host Coach Furtado. Without further ado, let's dive in. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Bridging Impact Podcast. Today, I am excited to have on our guest of the day, Riley Lane, who is a catching and recruiting coordinator at Paradise Valley Community College in Arizona. All right, let's get right into it. Um, You know, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I think... I don't know if I have just a bias for ba- baseball and basketball, obviously, but that's that's the you know the coaches that end up being on. You know, it's been such an important part of my life, and you know, talking about you know the importance of sports in our lives. You know, how has the game of baseball made an impact on yours? I mean, the the game of baseball, in my opinion, is probably one of the most beautiful sports. Um, along that, you could say with basketball, I just think that there's. There's so much involved in the sport of baseball that just translates into life that makes coaching and being involved in any way, shape or form, just a very special thing. Um, The impact baseball's had on my life is, baseball is my life, um, essentially. You know, uh, my friends and my family um, are pretty close to exactly that. My friends are my family. and my family are my friends. And I've met a lot of people throughout baseball that have made me a better person, both on and off of the field. And it's an absolute honor to be able to get to do what I love and go to a baseball field every single day. 100%. Yeah, I love that. And just recognizing that the connections between, you know, a team, right? Like, you know, when you think about it, especially in, I feel like collegiate sports, you end up spending more time with, you know, those people, aka your team, than like, you know, your people in your personal right life so that it becomes your family. And then those connections just lead to so much. So can you talk about, you know, what your, you know, transition from player to coach was like and, and what made you want to get into coaching? You know, what made me want to get into coaching, I think I always had that ability on the field to be a player coach. Um, and growing up, I, I had some of the greatest mentors that I could ever ask for that when I was a little kid, I never had any idea that they'd be you know, my bosses or my colleagues or somebody to help me get to the point that I am at now. But when I was growing up, all the coaches were, you're going to be a good coach one day. You're going to be a good coach one day. And as a kid, you know, you just want to play. You just want to, you know, have fun with your boys. You want to chase something that's bigger than you end up going to college and the whole nine. But I think that there's something so special about when I was a player is because I think that I always knew that I wanted to be in the game for a very long time. I just didn't know to what capacity that would be at. Um, And with me, you know, I had three shoulder surgeries and I played college football as well. So, you know, the coaching became more of a reality at a younger age then I'm sure that it is for some people because some people see that the game is taken away from you if you don't have that ability to be where you were at one point in time. And for me, it was my fifth year of college, you know, trying to make a, a comeback to uh, play the baseball season, played the fall, ended up going in the early spring, and just something something clicked, something changed. You know, I, I was always really cordial with my college coaches because I just took the game very seriously. You know, um, wasn't a brown noser, but I was always that kid asking the coach questions, always going into his office, picking his brain, 
you know, if I didn't know the ins and outs of our game plan or how we were going to do something, then I feel like I couldn't bring the best of my athletic ability as a player. So then once, you know, my ability started to decline, the mental started to increase. Um, and I always was able to put myself in a coaching mindset. But in that transition from player to coach, I really was able to almost coach as if I was a player. And it allowed for me to form really great relationships with my players, form really great relationships with administration because they know that we're taking a gamble on a younger coach. But I was able to show them that age was actually a positive thing and not a negative thing. Because in today's age, you know, the, the youth don't really have the work ethic that our parents' generation have. That's just, I'll be 100% honest about that. And without taking away this new generation, it's just they have so much more resources than we had growing up, you know. So for me, just the the ability to transition from player to coach almost seemed like a no-brainer because of all the years of everybody saying, oh, you can do this, you can do this. Then when I finally came back to Arizona, you know, a coach of mine, Randy Ford, who I hold near and dear to my heart, got me a coaching job at, a, at the high school that I went to that he was coaching at and said, hey, we'd love to have you out. I didn't really know what was going to come of it. And after that first year, I pretty much knew that my dream of coaching was not just a far out plan. It was actually hopefully in the realm of expectations that this could be a profession of mine. And that's why I do it. I love it. And I hope to uh, continue this passion as long as I possibly can. Yeah, I love that. And I, there's so many great gold nuggets of wisdom that you're kind of talking about and sharing in your story. A couple of things that I'm kind of hearing through there is like you're talking about your curiosity just as a player. I feel like also your ability to connect and relate as a player, which is one of the areas I want to go to next and just kind of recognizing the mindset that it takes to just really think the game, right? Whether you're thinking the game of baseball, football, basketball, whichever sport it is, there's so much that goes to it. That's more than just, you know, hitting the ba hitting the baseball, shooting a basketball, throwing the football, or running the football. You know, there's kind of a lot of intricacies that goes into it. And there's a lot of curiosity when it comes to being a coach. And, you know, you talk about that curiosity and, and your ability to relate to players, which is, I think, what I think, you know, kind of what I hear is, is one of your, you know, strengths as a coach. And I feel like one of our, my strengths as a coach too, is in it, when it comes to being able to relate and connect. And I feel like that's a really important part of leadership. So can you talk about how you connect, relate and build relationships with your players now? I think first of it, first of all, it comes from patience. I mean, as, as you know, being a coach is so stressful because to be a coach is not just an X and O's type of thing. There's something that I believe in every single coach. Uh, they do it for the love to be able to help out other players. You know, they love the game so much that they want to devote their time to help young people grow and develop. And, you know, I think part of building um, relationships and leadership for that matter is quite simply having the patience to learn somebody because everybody's always different. You know, everybody's got a different walk of life. Everybody's got a different story to tell, you know, parents, parents raise kids different ways, you know, so you almost have to be so patient to understand why somebody acts a certain way or why they don't act a certain way. You know, and as a coach, it's so easy to line up, go run. It's just so, it's so easy to punish kids while they're growing where, you know, I feel like I have the ability to, you know, be stern. Trust me, every one of my players will probably tell you that I'm on the hard ass side of things, but I don't think any one of them will ever question how much I care about them because first and foremost, Baseball, for my matter, is something that we get the privilege to do. It's not who we are, you know, and being able to separate that you're a person before a ball player is the most important thing. Because at the end of the day, you know, as much as every coach would love to have that next superstar go X amount of years and be a Hall of Famer, come back and thank his high school coach, the reality of that is very low. So how do you make an impact on kids to not only want to get better, 
at the sport, but become better human beings. And I think that there's a huge correlation between um, leadership and just coachability. You know, I think there's, there's methods in building leadership and team camaraderie. Um, but at the end of the day, you, you have to find something where the whole team can be like this. And as a coach, it's not about being liked. It's not about being favorited. It's, it's simply what are you doing for these 20 to 26 players to make them all come together? And, you know, it might be controversial, but I say it all the time. I go, I would rather have 26 players on our team come together and dislike me than have three or four like me. And then we all, we're all clicky doing their own thing, you know? And ho hopefully I, I gain their respect. That's, that's the number one goal. But at the end of the day, to build what I believe championship programs need is you got to come together. And that comes on and off of the field. It comes with your expectations. It comes with players holding other players accountable because at the end of the day, good teams are led by coaches, but great teams that win championships are led by players. And if as a coach, I can allow them to build the autonomy to be the best that they can possibly be. I feel like I've done my job in building leadership and just an environment that, you know, the expectation is to be the best that you can be every single day while understanding that winning is important, you know? And I think that's, that people walk a fine line of, you know, they, they are, are fascinated by winning that they don't know how to learn from losses. So to me, it's, it's all about coming into work every single day, being the best that you can be, doing your job and uplifting others. And once you realize that your team is as strong as your weakest link, you can accomplish just about anything. You don't need, you don't need the best guys. You need the best group. You know, I, I always say, it, I, I don't want the best nine. I want the right nine. That's it. I think I think we can build we can build winning baseball if we got the right nine people on the field at the same time. Yeah, that's so true, and I think that's one of the things that you see in the MLB playoffs specifically, more so than any any other sport, is because you know, like you know, the Diamondbacks are in your backyard, and and Tori Lavello and and their team. I don't know the four words. They have like four words. It's like love, commitment, trust. And, and I brought it up in another podcast. And it's like on paper, they may not be the most talented team. And although they have, you know, they have great bats, right? Great young bats and great pitching. You know, their commitment and, and buy-in from their entire team is one of the reasons they were so successful in the postseason, even though they 100%. lost the World Series. Um, but at the end of the day, I feel like no one at the beginning of the, the postseason, let alone the season, I don't know what the betting odds were. They were definitely not not favored right there's the dodgers yeah. the braves the astros and you know kind of diving into that you talked a little bit about the, the leadership development and having the right nine not the best nine and i think that's like actually that's really key um, I'm, I'm gonna have to steal that quote from you about the, having the right five not the best five um yeah. and, and i'm definitely gonna bring that one up i think that's a great quote um but you know recognizing and getting everyone to buy in on the same page you know and developing their leadership skills where do you begin with that you know, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I feel the state of Arizona is a baseball hotbed. Um, but what do we have to show for it? You know, <laughs> as, as as prominent as our professional and college teams have been in the past, it's been a long time since we've been there. Um, and I think that, you know, you mentioned the culture aspect of things and you know tori tori lovello did such a great job on building a culture and he, he said it all year long you know a connected team is a dangerous team and with that comes an immense amount of pressure of not allowing yourself to look at the people across from you and say oh he's big he's fast he's strong he's better than me and it's about being able to look within your own program in your own team and look around and know that there's a hundred percent buy-in that we are going to be the best that we possibly can be. And if we are the best that we possibly can be, we put ourselves in a situation to succeed. Um, and so I don't think I answered your question, but just, just building, building the culture, you know, is, is to me the toughest thing that I think any coach or, you know, admin or general manager has because you know in today's world you can just get on twitter you can get on whatever platform you want and see the athletic ability of a kid and for me that's all good and good and gravy but i i 
I'm not huge on that. I've had some great players. Don't get me wrong. I've had some really, really great players that have made coaching easier in a way, but they've also made it easier because the good talent that I've gotten to have were top tier leaders, you know, and they came to me on how to express their leadership. So I was there to assist in that role of enhancing what they can be outside of what their talents are to make everybody around them better, you know? And I think there's, there's nothing more powerful than when you get a, a draft type kid or a D1 type kid that doesn't just walk around like he's that guy, you know? And I think, you know, the, the way that they're raised has a lot to do with it, but also, like you said, you know, we see these kids sometimes more than their parents do, it, at least for it, a stretched out period of time where if, you know, the, the love for one another and building the autonomy isn't there, your, your, your culture is not going to do anything. You know, you, I don't, I don't want to bash any of the big league teams, but you know, you look at the Padres and this was a team that on paper, they said they're going to, you know, break the NLB record for season wins. They're going to go win the world series. And, you know, that's a lot of pressure. Don't get me wrong, but with a payroll like, like that, there, there should be no problem to at least get to the, the playoffs, you know, but with, with the way that Tory did things, a connected team is a dangerous team. And it, it, it quite literally proves that because just like in the work field, you know, if you have a group that is set on the same goal that actually cares about the success of others as much as they care about the success for them, then you are building a space, not only where kids are going to come in, practice hard, play hard, but they're going to come together. They're going to love each other. They're going to form relationships that will last forever. Um, and it's just, it, it, it's just one of those things that I think get overlooked because it's so hard to be a part of. It is so hard to be a part of such a, a tight knit, um, group in anything that you do, whether it's a friendship, whether, you know, it's, it's a baseball team, a basketball team, football team, you know, a, a pickleball partner, you know what I mean? It's just, if, if. If you don't have the intent to be the best that you can be to bring out the best in others, then I don't think that there's the ability to build a foundation of leadership. So I think I danced around your question, but I was just talking a little while. No, I like where you're, where you're going with it. And I actually, you know, have a little bit of information where it comes to, uh, you know, like I'm actually an A's fan and Bob Melvin was the manager of the Padres this year. And, and Melvin actually told and the, one of the the A's, one of the people I listened to for the A's, that is just like, I don't know if this team has it this year, right? Because they weren't connected. It wasn't the talent was there. The talent was right. always there, but it's because they had three to five, you know, what do you want to call it? Like superstars, right? That this is my team. This is my team. And when you have, you know, the best nine doesn't mean you have the right nine. And clearly, you know, they didn't have the right nine. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you look on, at the Diamondbacks, right? And, and they didn't have the right nine. So I'm just curious, you know, and I don't know if the, I don't think there's a right answer about this, but just talking like, you know, two coaches talking when you get a team, right? And you have a ton of talent, what percent falls on the coach and what percent do you think falls on the players to become the right nine or the right five or the, what do you call it? The right, right 11 for football? Uh, you know, <sighs> That's a tricky question. I, I yeah. always say that, you know, when, when you're coaching, especially amateurs, I believe you're a 10% athletic coach and you're a 90% life coach yeah. Um, yeah. because you're building exactly that is, I think, probably an 80-20 split to answer your question because I think it, it is a challenge for a coach to put the players in the right position to A, succeed but B, not have any fall off within what's going on, you know? And that takes an immense amount of responsibility from a player to, you know, nobody wants to bat the nine hole, but I'll, I'll be 100% honest, you know, that here's a little insight about me on coaching. One, two, and nine hole is the most important in my lineup because, you know, one and two, they're, they're gonna be your one and two guys. Most people are gonna understand why they're in the top of the order. But people are always going to question, why is that guy in your nine hole? Why is he in your nine hole? And it's because I need, A, I need my lineup to roll over. But B, I'm going to have two leadoff hitters in my lineup. So we're always just punching. We're always just punching. Punch, counter, punch, punch, counter, punch. Until, 
You know, if you're on the ropes, then your players are going to understand that my coach has done exactly what he needs to do to put us in a position to succeed. Now it's our job to not let the pressure get the best of us and trust our abilities to do what we can do to push together wins and push together success. And, you know, in, in today's world, everything's results driven. All these kids, they, they just want the instant gratification of, you know, we won or I scored 30 points or I hit two home runs. And that's just not the reality of it. It's, it's how do you win on your, on your worst days? You know? So I would say 80, 20, because, you know, you got to have a plan as a coach, you got to put them in the right positions, whether they understand it or don't, it's your job to make them understand why this is the way that it is. And I'm putting you guys in a position to succeed, whether or not you agree with it, it will show if you do what we've been practicing and what we've been preaching, because that's the, that's the environment because 80% of why I say 80% players is because, you know, it, it, it's not just come and play, you know, it's, it's come get locked in, make sure that everybody's on the same page because iron sharpens are iron, you know, and I'll, I'll say it again. You're only as strong as your weakest link. And if your weakest link on your team is doing his job to the best of his ability, then you're dangerous. You're absolutely dangerous, you know, and just like in basketball, you know, the six man's probably one of the most important people in the entire team. And you look at, you know, I, I look at old school basketball like Jamal Crawford and it's like those teams were so good when you had a six man come off the bench that realistically is a starter everywhere else. And that, like I do with my nine hole is you can pout and moan that you're in the nine hole, but I promise you that there's a kid on the bench who I'm going to get in the game at some point that would be itching and dying to be the nine hole starting off this game. And where, where it falls is where it falls, you know, and then the other 20% is us coaches making the decisions and calling the right plays and making the right moves and making sure that we can, you know, put some pressure on and take a lead and hold a lead and see, see what we're made of. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I like where you're going with that. And in terms of that, I, I think that's one of the things that I re reiterate all the time. And I think sometimes it, it matters on, on what team you have, what your personnel is, right? Like, I think you're blessed if you have a team where you could probably bat, you know, 12 guys and, right. and you choose between one through nine, you know, it's a little bit harder, especially, you know, middle school, high school, it depends on kind of the level. If you only have six or seven guys and you have to bat nine, right? There's less of like that urgency that's like, oh, I'm batting seven coach. I could probably bat four or five, you know, mm -hmm. when in the reality with the 12, right? You have someone on your butt, you know, and, that, and that's where the co competition really kind of matters. And I kind of want to go into your point of, of what you're talking about. Like this generation has the most resources ever, right? They could go and listen to this podcast and get better, mm -hmm. right? They, it's like a thousand different podcasts that they could listen and get better. Like there's so many YouTube videos where they can go and, and get better and they have to take that initiative um i'm just curious you know when it comes to you know where we're at and, and the work ethic and, and you know some of it is probably entitlement with club ball and, and their parents pay and, and they get to play right versus you know right now i'm the battle i'm having at high school basketball and i re have to reiterate all the time just so it's in their mind like i don't i you don't have a minute of playtime guaranteed like mm -hmm. not a single minute. Um, I have 12 guys who can hoop. So if you're the eighth guy, you don't think you, you want to put in effort. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll find someone to replace you. I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, and I think really getting them to understand that is just such an important life skill. And it's not, you know, I think sometimes like we, we get too positive, right? And that's why I kind of try and talk about productive versus positive. Um, because sometimes it's like, we want to kind of baby them. I'm like, especially because at high school and especially because I'm a younger high school, right? Collegiate, I feel like there's there are certain expectations. And where I'm going with this is just to kind of continue to expand on where we are in the sports world, right? I just want to talk about that in terms of like entitlement and, and kind of what you see at the community college and baseball level when it comes to that. Yeah. You, you know, the, these kids have such access to resources, but so do we as coaches. So how do we not let our emotions be worn on our sleeve and be like, you guys have all these resources. Why aren't you using them? Well, at the end of the day, you have to, you know, conduct yourself in a manner to want to build an environment where they want to learn. You know, they, they, they understand that, you know, th then you're just a parent at that point, you know, go on YouTube, research this guy, you know, go on Twitter, see your competition, you know, but it, it's, it, the entitlement really stems from the resources being so readily accessible, you know, and 
because when I was growing up, when I was in high school, you know, the huddle was just now coming out. Um, Twitter had just came out, you know, all, all of these things that are now just uh, a commodity are, were, were being figured out. And now that they're figured out, it's, you know, how do you, how do you get the kid to get off of Fortnite and understand the game of baseball a little bit more? And in the last, you know, this is year seven for me coaching. And from year one to year seven, um, the biggest disconnect and entitlement, I think, is just they think that if they come in for an hour and a half, two hours, then that's all they need to do in terms of learning. And whereas our generation, not to, I'm not saying that th this younger generation is, is worse off or better off, but, you know, there was a way that we grew up with old VHS films as kids, you know, DVD coming out where we had to see the evolution of how good things got, where now kids just see everything's at the pinnacle. So they don't really need that resource. Or I think I'm good enough because I work with this trainer and I go work out and then I have practice, um, you know, and so, but to answer your question, the disconnect, uh, or at least the entitlement change from high school to junior college, is not necessarily that much different. I just think once you get to college, they start to understand that A, I love this, B, I have to treat this like a job because you know, school is six hours a day, practice is three to four hours a day. You got an hour of weights after that where you gotta you gotta crunch in your time to look at the video of your swing, you know, work on the f basic fundamentals when practice is over, where you start to build that that world at the junior college level of if you guys want to go to where you say you want to go, i.e. the division one level or pro or whatever, you have to take this game way more serious than you ever have before. And I think where that disconnect does come from, I'm not here to bash anything, but you know, when I was in high school, I learned when I was in high school coaching, I learned that the travel ball season and the high school season is an entirely different sport and they're playing the same game and for a long time it, it almost frustrated me that you know kids would a coach i gotta go to club ball practice i gotta go to club ball practice and it's like is is club ball practice gonna win us a state championship you know and I, i'm all for you getting your work and getting better but from february to may you have a high school team that's a small fraction of the time that you spend with your club ball team throughout summer, throughout fall, throughout winter, doing your thing. But at the end of the day, you, your parents pay a lot of money for you to be on those club teams for, in most cases, there's some club, some club teams, you know, especially summer ball, that is a different story um, based off of talent level. But, you know, some of these club teams have one really good team that are being funded by the lower level teams. And so you see, you know, three or four of those club team club team kids that play together at the same high school that have to play with these non club type kids that, you know, how do you build the environment where it's not just, oh, I play for this club team and I play for this club team. So I'm automatically going to be a starter at the high school level because it's that's just not how it works. You know, club ball is is for me, I think club ball should be a resource to Play your games, get your at bats, get your innings, develop, get better. Um, and if you're in a tournament and you win it, all all the power to you. You're learning how to win high pressure games. But when you come into the high school world, it's it's a true team. These club ball teams are they, they're just you know how do we fill our roster this weekend for the MLK tournament, for the Winter Nationals, for whatever it may be, where you're not building the the family and connected camaraderie of a, a, a team and in baseball and even in basketball, you know, obviously one, one, one player can really change the whole direction of a team just off of their talent. And then you build underneath them because club ball teams, you can, you can pick and choose 15 studs that you want. And in high school, you're granted to the district, you know, parameters that, that allow you to go to your high school and compete for a championship and do all that other stuff. So that difference from high school to, college is that club ball scene's not there anymore you know so they're truly from august to may one team trying to figure out you know 
where do I fall? How do I make myself better? How do I make my team better? And then, you know, hopefully make the playoffs. Hopefully you go to a college world series. And then, you know, depending on how many innings you threw or how many ABs you got, then your summer turns into uh, what do I need to work on? How do I get more at bats? How do I get more innings pitched? How do I refine my third pitch? Stuff like that. Where I think if club ball coaches emphasize the importance of why they're playing club baseball would actually make that a beneficial thing for all, not just some, if that makes sense. No, hundred percent. I mean, I, I was actually going to ask a follow-up question on club baseball and then you kind of just went into it, which is really great because, you know, I think what you're kind of talking about and, and that's why I've been kind of against the club basketball world. I coach a 10 year old club team and multiple times, like I wasn't the director of it. So they would send, you know, different guys, they'd play with us and never, they'd never practiced with us before. What are you doing? Like, that's not a team. You got to earn number one, you got to earn your spot. And so that's what, that's why I'm, you know, kind of, I I've stayed away from the club basketball team scene. I have parents asking me, are you going to do it? And there's thoughts of me, you know, being like, maybe I want to do like a select team where if you have trained with me for long enough, like you can, and you've earned your way, maybe I'll do a team, but you, I'm not just going to do a team to, you know, go, like you say, go to the MLK tournament and, Hey, let me grab my couple guys that I coach over here. And my couple guys that coach over here and bring them together. Like that's just not about development. Um, and I think that's, that's where I would say like, you know, kind of uh, some of the disconnect is, is they get to play all year round. So they just feel like they have this expectation that I, I need to get at bats or I need to, you know, take X amount of shots or I get X amount of play time. I'm like, no, this is high school basketball, right? Same thing for college. I mean, college is even more, right? Because you, if you don't win, your coach is, your coach is getting fired, you know, and the, that sucks, right? So coaches are going to, you know, have a, a certain expectation. And I had the conversation yesterday that you have to perform. And I think one of the things that's that's hard about and that's, you know, I actually have empathy for this generation is because they always see highlights, whether they always see home runs and diving plays, is they always expect and think that that's what they have to do to be successful in a coach's eyes. When in reality, that's that's their friend's eyes, that's social media's eyes, but that's not coach's eyes. And so can you talk about how you help your athletes through failure and to, you know what, just execute the fundamental plays and that's how you actually get play time? Yeah, I you know, I, I think that's what makes me the coach that I am is, you know, is I want to be the most prepared team every single time we step foot in the game. And with that comes a grueling amount of effort in practice. I mean, you have to really, if, if you're going to play for me and the coaching staff that I'm with now, we expect you to go balls to the wall in practice. You know, there, there's a time to, to slow it down, but the games should be easy. You should practice so hard that when you're in a game and you have all these time between pitches, that it seems easier. And with that comes coaching the fundamentals. And I think, you know, to hit back on the club thing again, they, 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 don't, they don't teach the fundamentals. So by the time that they're of a mature age, 14, 15, 16 years old, and the athleticism is catching up with them and the strength is catching up with them, that... They see how far they hit the ball, but they know nothing about the fundamentals. They've never been taught it. They've never thought that it was important because, like you said, they go on ESPN and they watch, you know, Aaron Judge hit 500-foot home runs multiple times in the game, hit 60 bombs. That's all good and good and grand, but at some point when he was a young dude, absolutely had a coach on his side teaching him the fundamentals and importance of where the – where you need to hit the ball in certain situations, how you become a hitter. And that's what allows you to have that identity um, to be a true gamer. And I, I, it's not just the club thing. I see it. I see it in high school and colleges still to this day is you, sometimes you'll go against a team and be like, damn, that team talent wise is absolutely insane. But you can tell that they don't work on the fundamentals. Their pregame is sloppy. Their butt defense is sloppy. You know, their PFPs are, are sloppy, their base running is bad, but that's, that's a stem of, you know, the lack of fundamental coaching that they had from the years leading up to it. And so that, that process of coaching the fundamentals in my mind is the most important thing because if they understand the fundamentals, the pressure will never be too high. It'll never, ever be too big where 
you know, you're in the bottom of the ninth, you're down by one, you got a leadoff double runner on second. Now we got to hit behind the runner to get him on third, give him in scoring position. And we got two outs to get him there. You know, whereas everybody nowadays is, you know, I'm a true gap to gap hitter. Okay. Well, you're a gap to gap hitter who was taught launch angle at 13 years old and you're hitting 250 with, you know, an, an ungodly amount of strikeouts. Yeah. You have a lot of home runs, but you know, say you're a 15 home run guy and you got 25 RBIs, like how good of a hitter are you true? Um, to me, that's, that, that's one of two things. One, you're selfish, which in our program, I have, I have got no tolerance for selfish players. And two, you were just never actually um, exposed to the fundamentals of this sport. And like baseball or like basketball, I think baseball has – the most direct uh, importance of fundamentals. You know, I, I watched I watched college basketball quite a bit. Um, you know, watching Wisconsin play basketball versus all these other Big Twelve school, Big Ten schools is they slow the game down. They really, really slow the game down and have a plan for every time that they have an offensive possession to capitalize on a high field goal percentage because that's the name of their game. If they can shoot, you know, 55%, 60%, chances are they're going to win that game. A, you can go against a team that doesn't know how to play slow, which goes into your favor because you slow them down, or you go against a team that has no ability of the fundamentals to understand what they're trying to set up, you know? And for me, in this baseball world, the two most underlooked um, fundamentals nowadays, which is starting to make its its arrival back in baseball, is base running and bunting. You know, the 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 small game in baseball, it's not pretty, and it's it's nothing that somebody wants to do. I understand that, but it's so important. You know, it's 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 how it's how you get ahead in the one run game, which I talk about all the time. Winning one run games is the most difficult thing in baseball because sometimes you lose one zero, but when you understand the importance of the fundamentals and, you know, the players that I've had understand that I'm huge on the fundamentals is because we're never going to lose one to zero because we're going to, we, our fundamentals design us to scratch one run in a game. That's it. And it, it, it's simplifying fundamentals, making drills fun, making working hard, you know, something that's ingrained in you that, you know, I want you guys to leave the ball field absolutely gassed and not in the expression, you know, we made you run and you threw up. It's just you understand that repetition, repetition, repetition at a high level of all these small fundamentals that nobody else does is going to scratch you enough wins to put yourself in a good playoff spot. And, you know, if it comes down to one game, two games, three games, or even a half a game, I guarantee you that team that snuck in does the fundamentals just a little bit better than the team that missed out on. That's just my, that's just my, that's just my, my personal opinion, but you know, it, I, I can't, I, I, I love to recruit the best players, but you know, it falls under, under the line of me trying to get the right nine is man. If, if you're a 40 Jack kind of guy and I don't get you, how do I make my team better with a guy who doesn't hit 40 home runs and, you know, provide some pop in our lineup and, Hopefully with fundamentals, we are able to, you know, put some runners in scoring position and learn, you know, the basic uh, situational hitting to scratch across some runs. It doesn't have to be pretty, but, you know, if you understand the fundamentals, you put your team and other players in positions to succeed. And, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little different. I like to tell people that, you know, I, I, I'm very old school with a new school approach. And I understand the way the game's changing. I understand athleticism. As you know, you see 12 year olds dunking and, and doing that whole nine, but you know, it's all good if you can do the big things big, but if you're not doing the little things at a high percentage, then at some point you're going to get passed up on. And I don't want that. I don't, I don't, if I have the ability to make you a better player and understand this game inside and out and understand the fundamentals, I don't want to see you get exposed when I'm not your coach. Anymore. I want to, I want to hand you off and be like, I'm proud of that kid. And take no credit from it. I don't want any credit from it. I just want to be a piece in that kid's journey that allowed him to become the best that he could possibly be.
hundred percent. I mean, I always talk about that. It's 90% fundamentals, right? I mean, you can flashy passes, dunks, home runs, right? Like that's great, right? That's a percentage of the game. And I do get that, you know, at least in the game of baseball now, like oftentimes the the team that home, homers more wins, um, but there is so much more in it. I think, you know, obviously now that the, the game has changed with like, you know, bunting and, and actually that's how we won our sections championship in high school um, is we actually, I, you know, we came in and this team had won the sections title two years before they came into our house because we were the number one seed and they were all types of cocky and, you know, they couldn't feel the bunt. We scored three or four runs because uh, they just threw away, you know, different throws from third base. Right. And so we ended up winning the sections title like six to one because they couldn't you know, feel the bunt. And we really, I had, I had one hit with two RBIs and that sealed the game with six to one. And, you know, I think it's just some of those like little things that, you know, people don't think about, right. I talk about all the time, like one turnover can be a four point swing. Cause we could have had a layup that would have been two points, but instead they got two and we lost by four. Right. Mm-hmm. So like those precision and little details and it's, you know, so I think sometimes the art of, especially the age and stage you're coaching at, right? Like college, you have a little bit more of an expectation, like you guys are just going to do this, right? But in high school, especially my ninth grade, how do I keep make this like somewhat fun, you know, to like yeah. hold on to the ball and, you know, kind of gamify things. But those little details, win or lose games. And I think those little details are what win or lose you getting a job, you know, yeah. when you are, you know, applying, right? Is your resume dialed in? Right. Or yeah. is your job interview, are you dialed in and ready to go? You have your, you know, your stories and stuff ready. You know, like those are the things that we're teaching right now that they can hopefully, you know, at a certain point, maybe may like, oh, coach is so annoying. Um, but, you know, 10 years down the road, they'll be like, ah, coach was right. Right. Like it's yeah. kind of like what we talk about with our parents when they say so many things and we're kids, we're like, ah, I know better than my parents. And then you realize 10 years later, you're like, oh, they were right. Right. Yeah. They were right about those things. So I think, you know, we talked about, so much you know good wisdom and knowledge and you know as we kind of hit the ninth inning of our podcast to last two minutes of our podcast i'd love for you to kind of just share in 10 years like what do you hope your players you know take away from you know your coaching and, and, and you know even the the coaches and parents that are listening to this episode you know i think about this all the time and i think it's what really after every season makes me keep coming back is I tell the kids all the time that in 10 or 15 years, regardless what you are in life, I want you to come up to me and give me a hug. And I'm not the most personable person ever. I, I understand I may not be the most approachable person ever. But one thing that I do think that every kid who leaves a season that I coached will know that in 10 or 15 years, they will have me on their side. And I would just hope that, you know, I instilled in them through sport to make the right decisions, to treat people the right way. Um, and just ultimately, if, if, if you be the best that you could possibly be and you do your job in 10 or 15 years, all I can do is give you a big hug and tell you how proud of, how proud of you I am. You know, and to me, that's everything, you know, is I, 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 I want to be a coach 10, 15 years from now and run into a guy that I coached and almost not even recognize them and just, and just be like, but what's going on with you? How are you doing? They, they tell me they have a family, they're married, they run this company or whatever it may be. And it's not, it's not, it's not important off of what their job title is. I just want, I just want them to be happy. I want them to have learned life's lessons through sports to where they can come back and be like, coach, I appreciate everything that you did for me. I know that you were there for me on the field and off the field because I tell these kids all the time before anything, I care about you guys as people far more than I care about the baseball player that you are. And if I can have a high turnover percentage of kids coming back 5, 10, 15 years from now, hopefully I'm a Division I head coach by that time, and they get to run in my program and, you know, get to talk to our kids and kind of do the whole nine is – you know, hopefully at some point that they were playing for me, they got to discover the autonomy within themselves to be the best person they could be. Come back, give me a hug and talk about the things that we've missed and reminisce on the good times. And, you know, hopefully I say it all the time. Hopefully one of the kids that I coached in my early years is, is on my staff one day that that would be a goal. 
Yeah, that's a dream. I love it. I think we need more coaches like you out there that just really care about the people before the player. Um, I just think that's just what our society needs. That's what sports are. I mean, sports are fun, right? But at the end of the day, we got to utilize the opportunity that we have to to be a life coach for these young people. So thank, thank you so much for your time today. Where can people find and connect with you if they want to you know, further the conversation? Yeah, uh, I'm on Instagram, Coach, coach Rilo. Um, let's see. LinkedIn, if you're looking for your next summer head coach or, or a, you know, a college gig, but pretty much the Instagram thing, uh, you can reach me there and yeah, we'll get connected at, at some point through, you know, I'll give you my phone number, my LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever it may be. But Instagram, Coach Rilo, uh, hit me up, DM me, do whatever you want. I'll, I'll answer your questions and do whatever I can. All right. Thank you so much for your time today, Coach Rilo. Looking forward to how the season goes for you all next fall, and we'll stay in touch. Thank you, Justin. Best of luck to you. For listening to this episode of the Bridging Impact Podcast. We'd love it if you would like, subscribe, leave a comment, and a review on whatever platform you're on. It's the best way to help us grow. We appreciate you for doing that. We'll shout you out on social media. I'd also love if you connected with me on social media. Let me know your thoughts, and this is why I do it. I want to share knowledge and wisdom from experienced leaders to people like yourself and myself so we can have this dialogue and move forward make an impact on the world. So, Stay tuned, stay subscribed, cheers.